Hello, I'm Sue Boyer, a former supervisor of the Knox County School System, and now I'm retired. Today's February the 9th, 2011. I'm here at the Knox County Central Office in the Andrew Johnson Building, and I'm here for the purpose of interviewing the illustrious John R. McLeod. John R. is retired now. Uh, he was a former um, teacher, uh, principal, he had a lot to do with the Knox County Teachers Federal Credit Union. And John R., you have made a significant uh, contribution to Knox County Schools, to the boys and girls, and to the community. And we are having this interview for the Knox County Museum of, His of Education. And we know that people that read and research in the future will look at this interview and that will help them to understand the past. So it's, it's an interview for the future and looking uh, at the past. I want you to be comfortable, John R., because here's the deal. You know that we all are part of history. You are too. You made significant contribution to Knox County and now you get to tell your story because as being a part of history, someone's going to tell about it. And so you can tell it yourself and tell it like you want to. So thank you for being here today. And I'm going to start with a question just to get you started. And then I know that you've got a lot of things you can tell us that you won't need me to intervene. <laughs> when we first started thinking about the Museum of educational history. We said it was the beginning. It was a beginning of collecting artifacts and those kind of things that would be good for, for the future. So I want you to start with your beginning, John R. Tell us a little bit about when you were born. I guess you're growing up years maybe through college and then we'll take another look at the question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, <clears throat> I grew up in Athens, Tennessee uh, my mother died when I was two years old and I went to live with an aunt and uncle, my mother's only sister. And she had children and then I had brothers and sisters also and they went to live different places. So after so long I just called mom and pop Benton so I lived there forever. And then I went to uh, Forest Hill Elementary School, went to McMinn County High School, then I went to Tennessee Western College, it was a junior college, two years. And I was always active in my church and doing things like that. And teaching was a kind of a finding teachers couldn't find it. And I had a marvelous Sunday school teacher, a Mr. Love. And he said, J I was always called Jack at home until Miss Doyle had me called John R. And uh, so I said, why don't you uh, apply for teaching school? They're just desperate. So I went home, talked to mom and pop. And of course, the family I lived in, we had plenty and I said, but they weren't blessed with money. And I said, but well, I can pay my college that way. But my daddy had paid me another part, my real father. Then uh, I went to school that I, t I went to. First school I taught in was Idlewild School where the children are idle and kids were wild. <laughs> and so they named that well, you think? And, yes, out in the country. So there I was 19. I taught third grade, never taught a day in my life. The first day I taught school, I wrote some things down I was supposed to do, you know. By the time lunch time's come, I'd done all that. Then some little kids said, Mr. McLeod, can you spell Czechoslovakia? And I thought, hell, what am I going to do? So I said, put up on the board the spelling word. I had that quick wit thing, so we learned that. But I survived that. But you had oil floors, pot bedded stove, and I said, well, at least we'll stay warm. And the building had never been painted. You know, I like stuff pretty. So I got some parents, we painted my room. Then I was the most unpopular teacher on the staff, but we got them all painted. That's back when schools didn't get anything done by the county. Then I, I went to UT that summer. I came back and taught the sixth grade in the same school that year, and that coached a basketball team, and uh, the cafeteria was one place, and they had to come through my room to go to the cafeteria. And of course, have the boys and girls, you had the girls, bathroom toilets up that way boys this way outside outside and so you didn't have this running back and forth when it's cold but anyway that was always good days and then I then the next year I went to UT then I came back and taught two months because that school started early and I taught two months 
and then I went to UT and finished. And the first job I got in, now I was in business major, so then I went to education. And the first job I got in Knox County was principal at Klondike School. I was a gold dust kid. Anyway, I taught sixth, seventh, eighth grade. Bought, helped buy cafeteria food, helped clean up. We had some boys who cleaned it up. It's a nice little building. It's been changed to somebody built, bought a house, has a house out there now. Mm -hmm. So I went there and they had their own TV, what it looked like when they started. So that was a year, and that's the time that I was ringing the bell out there and I lost a clapper. Well, Miss Doyle heard about that, and I asked to meet Miss Doyle, said, I have a prince that lost his clapper today. <laughs> Just things like that, you know how she was. But anyway, uh, then I taught there, then I went to mascot, teaching principal. I was still single. And uh, so, uh, it was very new. They said, you're going to mascot? And I said, my philosophy is you treat people like you like to be treated. And it goes, you get around. And I was there 10 years. Wonderful place. I still have some wonderful friends. Like Kathy, of course. I'll be there tonight. And things like that. And I have me fond memories. And I go now, there. let me interrupt a minute. Yes. John, are you referring to Kathy Green? Green. That just passed just away. Just passed away. Okay. She was there at, at mascot when you were there? Yes. She's a former student. Okay. Uh -huh. And uh, so, uh, but it was so good. They had money. American Zinc Company had a lot of money, and they gave school a lot of money. Did they, I was going to ask you, did the Zinc Company there in the community, did they sort of subsidize the school? Well, not like at one time. See, they built the building, the other uh -huh. original uh -huh. building there. And then uh, in the cafeteria, Miss Abernathy was the cafeteria manager, and there were no eating places there, so she had a little place in the kitchen that I had permission that they could eat there, like Mr. Some of the Wheels and, uh, would eat there. And Mr. Arthur was one that says, he's, he's up there. So you had to drive around mascot school that had potholes. So he's coming one day and I parked the cars and he had to drive around there. And he said, I said, how'd you do? He said, well, those potholes will be fixed. And he brought trucks and gravels and the whole thing. Now, you probably parked his car there so he would have to do that. <laughs> yeah, didn't I did. Okay. Yes, planned but, that. Okay, that was a good one. But, you know, I had, uh, it's a wonderful place. And um, the hardest thing I had to do was after, but we did a lot of things. We had, we had, we did a folk festival and you put every kid in school in it. Every classroom did a certain thing, you know. And, uh, and the building was pretty. And, uh. So the building needed to be painted, and Mr. Nicely was a chairman, you know, made me. So I got him to come up there, and he was just kind of a sucker for good-looking women. He's dead and gone. Can't talk about it now. I can talk about it now. <laughs> but anyway, so I got three of my good-looking women. I said, you dress on those holes. It seems to be straight and everything. And so I was there, and he come in, and he says, Got he says, USOB, you set me up. I said, yeah, but I got what I wanted. You got the building painted? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, did. Yeah. Got three colors. We started putting colors. And, but uh, it's just a wonderful place. And I, uh, but Miss Doyle was always good to me. And, boy, I, I, I back up, back, back to begin teaching school. Uh, a lady, I stayed in a lady's house on 17th Street, Emma Fennell, who's a former principal. And she kept boys from Athens there, and I stayed when I, when I was going to university. And uh, we were at Captain Andy's, a restaurant down Cumberland, good place to eat. And we were there, and Miss Patterson, Miss North, was leaving, and, and it, Emma said, will not you meet this young man? And she said, he wants a job, and said he's got his degree. Miss North says, you got a job, come see me. And that's <laughs> when I got the job to go to Klondike School. Where I did all that stuff. And so that was your first experience with Mildred Doyle. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, then, see, I was there, and then I went to Mascot those times. And then when, see, Joyce, my wife is a library at Powell High School, and she's a Powell girl. We, uh, she was driving that long run, you know, I was driving to Mascot. I mean, then we, then I, we lived there a year when I went to Brickey. So we sat down and wrote Miss Doyle a letter. We'd like to, well, we'd like to buy a house and move it either Powell or Hall's community. And uh, wrote her a letter that I was interested in that principalship. Well, about 10 days later, I got a letter from her, written in green, you know. 
you will all, be, all important things were written in green, right? <laughs> you will be considered for this position. Well, a week later, I got a letter that says, the board has elected you as a new principal at Berkeley School. You tell no one. So, <laughs> so that's a secret. And I, he, she says, the only person working on the building is the general contractor, and he knows that. So I talked to him. But anyway, so we got Bricky open, Bricky up, and it was um, not finished. We opened, but we handled it. And, and I had kids from Halls and from Powell. And, you know, of course, they all say, well, I don't want my kid to go there. I don't want my kid to go there. And then after the first year, I said, I don't want to hear anything about Powell High School or no red for Halls High School or no orange for Powell High School. You don't wear those colors here. Well, after a period of time, it went like this. And then I, I couldn't get rid of them. <laughs> and then we had about 550, I guess. And uh, I, was, I was always have a great staff. And uh, I'm also a community person anyway. So uh, you look back at all these things you did, you know. And we always did a lot of things. I have some, like Irene Patterson taught with me and Alan Morgan's wife taught with me. And, and uh, we built a special program and we had uh, Miss Doyle came and some board members came and some of the commission came. We had a dinner, and I was we I, I planned it where I had my desk in the cafeteria, my secretary was there, and we was going to do it like tell the story to them through my interpretation to a new teacher. And of course, I always say they always be called the clouds harem, and I said she good looking, <laughs> <laughs> and then of course the board all made life, you know. And uh, so we got all those things and had a lot of new tables and stuff there. And I said, Miss Dolphin, your person just won't everything. You said that, and then she called me and said, they're yours. <laughs> she said, I couldn't tell everybody. But, uh, and then they, they said, John, oh, you're the golden child. She lets you do anything. And some principal called me and says, I said, if you'd keep your mouth shut, you wouldn't get in trouble like that. Well, you're Miss Doyle's favorite. She lets you do anything. I said, no, I just do what's right. But I never had, had never had a never had a bad year. You have things that happen. I said, and I, when I was at school, I said the thing it is now. I was at school a lot. Well, I went to community things, and I went to this, and I, when Josh and I went to church there, and and then when they'd have a mascot, when they'd have a revival, well, the Baptist church here, mascot here, Baptist Methodist church there, and so we'd all get together, you know. But I never. And I was always fortunate after I'd been in the salon to choose the teachers I wanted. See. So you chose good people that you surrounded yourself with. Some years, some years, I would not have a teacher change at all. But when you have young people, it's a uh, pregnancy, it's a question. I'll tell you one of the story. Uh, you know, kindergarten, I had four kindergarten teachers and they go home early. And Candy Shannon, when she came in, she said, I need to talk to you. I said, you're pregnant, aren't you? She said, I said, you got that look. <laughs> well, the next day, here come Gail Evans. I said, I need to talk. I said, you're pregnant too, aren't you? <laughs> yes. And then the third day, uh, Carletta Green came. I said, you're pregnant. I said, what are y'all doing? Y'all having an orgy or something? <laughs> and then Sheena Bill was the other teacher. So she didn't come in. I said, he may have to take this out. Anyway, he said that, uh, I said, Sheena, where were you? She said, I said, y'all have an orgy? She said, no, I kept my pantyhose on. <laughs> but anyway, stuff, you can delete all that stuff. But they, fe they felt free to talk with you oh, freely. Oh, yes, so. yes, yes. Sometimes they would say, uh, I, I was hard to great staff. We always communicated. We didn't have clicks going. But anyway, one time, uh, if I was kind of fussy in the morning, they said, don't talk about him this morning. He's not in a good mood. <laughs> so and, and, could, and, the, and the chain went around like this. So they knew to stay away from him. Well, isn't that what teachers do sometimes? If uh, Students can tell if they don't feel well, and they mm. sort of know to mm. back off a little bit. Uh, now, John, when you went there, it was Bricky School. Yes. Now, tell a little bit about the Bricky name, <laughs> because I want to ask you another question. It's not now just Bricky School. So. Oh. Uh, 
Well, see, I didn't know. I said I didn't know Bricky what it was, and Brick, Mr. Bricky was a former superintendent and on the board or something. I didn't know much about him because he he was dead. At the, I knew his wife. Uh -huh. But that's where the name came from. From, from him, him, yes. Okay. And I think he was principal at Central at one time. I'm not sure about that. Okay. But he'd been dead many years before I knew that. Now, when you go to the school today, it says Bricky McLeod School. Uh, tell a little bit about what that where well, the McLeod came from. Well, Diane Dozier had a lot to do with that. And they started right here, you know. Well, I said, oh, no, no, no. So they started, then it just mushroomed like this that we want to add McLeod's name to it. And they had petitions out, so and so out, so and so out. And then uh, they met with uh, the board, whoever did it, and uh, uh, who had built a big pretty house out there, Pete. The bus. The bus. Uh -huh. I'd had his kids in school. And so Pete the bus, they called him, and he went there and presented it. He had those things in his hands. He said, if you don't name that school, you are sorry, we've got our business. <laughs> and he stayed the whole meeting. He didn't believe that. Well, I called him, and I'd had his two children in school. And he said, that's the least we could do for you. Well, I mean, it was nice. And I was humble. I remember when they unveiled the name, Diane and I walked up there, and we was both crying tears in our eyes, you know. It was a great day. It's a real honor, and it says that the community still uh, highly respects you, John R. D tell us a little bit about some of the students that went through, because how long were you at Bricky? A bunch of years. 34 years. 34 years. That's a long time to be at one school. So tell us a little bit about some of the students that went through there. Well, I had, uh, when I first started, I had about 500 and something, and then... Uh, teachers what we had to do is new and the building got smaller we had to add to it add to it add to it so one, at one time we had about 1100 in that building that's when teachers had 35 in the class right and somebody's talking about that she said I've got this I said if you just talk to 20 kids you are they are be marvelous because you remember when they when everyone had, had 35 was the, oh, really had, the rule not the exception yeah the first grade had 35 and I used to say and I had such a great staff, I said, I'd love to know what they do if they had 25. And then to get down that like that. But, uh, and I had, I had a teacher taught me one time, first grade, and she had some problems. And I had fourth grade vacancy, and she come talk to me. She said, that's Sheila, and she said, uh, if you let me have that fourth grade, I promise you, you will never have a parent complain about it. But see, that was her niche. She was good in first grade, but she didn't have the warmth and communication with parents like you have to do. But did she do well in fourth grade? Oh, yeah, did well. So you, you She lived in see. California. When I retired, she flew in to be there. Wow. So you made an impression on her, too, did you not? But I have Tina Wessel, you know, the millionaire. Yes. I had her in school. One, two, she comes into, we have a, now we, I'm jumping spaces, but we have a reunion group that meets every two months. And anybody who's retired from Bricky School, custodian, cook, whatever, can come. And we have a lot who come about 30. Oh, good. And so we meet and eat and have fun. And reminisce. When I had my 80th birthday, they had a big thing, you know. Invite all these people, neighbors. I met 100 people there, former people. And Jean Mills was the chairman. She said, I want each one of you to tell something about him. They did. And I said, I said, I want to say, remember, I do have the last word. <laughs> and did you tell stories about them? Well, some. Not, not too many, though. I, as they say, I need to write a book. Jake Mabes says I need to write a book. He's uh, one of my former students. Is he really? Yeah. And you really do, John R., because honestly, some of the things that you experienced, people need to know about that. And, and interviews and writing a book and and putting those stories into writing are really a, are wonderful. So why don't you tackle that? Well, just like we talked, listen, I, one night I went to bed one night and I wasn't going to sleep and I thought about school and I pictured out of while school and I shut my eyes and I could, I named, could name every teacher there and what the building looked like. And I could do that mascot all of them. So you need to write that down <laughs> while you can still remember them. Now, uh, someone told me that if they were looking for you, they might find you back over at Bricky McLeod School. Is that true? That's true. Yeah. I haven't been as busy this year because if they were doing something, yeah. but I used to go and work with first grade, they read to me. 
And when I go in the classroom, I'll say, and they'll, there, you, of course, they don't know me then, then. And I'll say, now I'm going to do this, so and so. But I said, now, I have chosen you t to read to me. Then I said, but I have two rules or regulations. The first thing is you have to be happy in here to come out and get a treat for me and read. Secondly, you have to smile. So I'm the big, and I said, they go. <laughs> And they do smile, I'm sure. And another thing, I teach them how to do this. <laughs> but anyway, it's uh, But you know, I visited every room every day. Uh, and I used to walk in a room, say, if I, you know, you're working hard. And I just walk in and I say, it's story time, or we'll do a little artwork right now. See, I've got a minor in art. And the teacher just sits down. Well, I was at Brick and McLeod School, and one well, teacher who taught with me, Linda Glass, excellent teacher. And I just walked room. I said to open her door, said she'd been me. And, and she just sat down and I told a story. And, they, and she said, they said, does he do that often? She said, all the time. <laughs> but those kids remember those stories. Oh, they enjoy that. And they enjoy knowing that someone else, besides the, the teacher is supposed to care about them. When they have an individual like you that come in, you're, you're just icing on the cake. Well, see, I never was a threatening person. And... Uh, there's eight teachers teaching there who are former students of mine. Oh, Brickie. really? At Ricky? Yeah, I have a niece's assistant music teacher, and the other music teacher's former student, you know. And they say, have you taught them? But anyway, it's, the, it's always enjoyable, though. I, any place I go, I see somebody I know. Well, no wonder. I went to the restaurant yesterday. We have Romeo group who meets men, and they give me a hard time. I said, if I die, what would y'all do? And what gets me when some people come in, so yesterday, I was there talking to some fellows about his children who I'd had in school. Asked me, one has a son, and one's always grandson. And I said, somebody, well, I just laid one on me. He says, ah, happy birthday, or hell, John R. And I don't think it was, some older lady. But somebody that she, you'd known from school, I suspect. Well, John R., I think back over your days in that you were an educator, either teacher or principal, you're bound to have some people you looked up to that were your mentors that you feel like shaped who you became? Of course, Miss Dolby, number one, I said, I mean, she became a personal friend. Um, I can't even tell you stories. I, when I was new, I went down to see her one afternoon. See, I was at mascot, so I stopped seeing her, and Miss Henry had gone home, and the secretary. Because I knew all those people, and I heard her in her office, and she was laying somebody out. I thought, oh, my goodness. <laughs> You're and glad it wasn't you, right? Me, yeah. Well, he came out, and I, and I spoke to him and everything, and she pushed that hair back like this. And I knew when she pushed her hair back, and beat her turns red, something wrong. But anyway, and she said, I said, I won't say anything. She told me, I said, what, she told what he did, I said, well, the father should have whipped him then. You know, if, I mean, if, you, if you're a prisoner and you yourself in some stupid place, you ought to get your tail whipped or something. She took care of him, though. Yes, she took care of him. So I learned it. Max Clendon used to throw a handkerchief in. See if she said mood, mood. <laughs> now tell us a little bit about Max Clendon, and that's a name I haven't heard in a while. Well, see, he was at Gibbs, and Jim Thurman, a friend of mine, well, he was in service, and I had some of his brother in school, sister. And he came back, and he wanted to do student teaching from Carson Newman, and he liked to do it at Mascot. So I called Miss Dole and asked if she gave him special permission. He had to have permission. So he worked with me, and uh, he was a marvelous person. But he had a younger brother, was full rotten. And he did something his mother told me. She said, well, you'll never teach him. And Ms. But his mother became a second mother to me. And he, he did the student teaching. Then when I went to Bricky, he taught me five years. No, he went to Shannondale first. Then he came to Bricky five years. And they thought, well, since you're all such good friends, maybe we are separate. But then they give him a principalship at Gibbs. He opened that new building. Yes. And uh, that Max is something else. Who else uh, influenced you? Beecher Clapp. Tell us a little bit about Mr. Clapp. Well, Beecher, you know, anything, he got flustered. But any time he saw you came in, he always wrote you something very complimentary. He'd be in school, he'd come up, we had meeting, but when uh, Green Hill was going to come, Copper Ridge. Well, see, I had to be principal both schools of that. And uh, so he'd come up there, and, but he'd always write down, he said, because I always had a pretty school, 
I always kept it pretty well. I always had it organized pretty, and I had, in that it always smelled good. It's always clean. I had a board member the other day, long. He's retired. He said. One thing about Bricky School, it always smelled good. Well, and boys and girls learn better in that kind of environment. That's just common sense. Oh, yeah. So, so you had that. Uh, I'll tell you one time, who was it? Uh, who was a phys ed, phys ed lady? Oh, I'll tell you a minute. Anyway, we're supposed to have a drill. Evacuation. We evacuate the whole building, you know. So. Drill. That day. It rained like cats and dogs. I said, I'm going to have it. So I took every grade, and we have a covered walkway. I marched them up there, marched them back, marched them up there, marched them back. But we did it, but not the way they wanted to. They said, Johnny, you're always doing stuff like that. But anyway, we were a Doggood Arts Festival Center and everything. We did all this decoration for seven, eight schools. And then we also did great programs. And one time, I remember Irene Patterson's son, we were going to this for the sixth grade. I'll come do all these things. And her son was there, and he was our leader. So they, and we had two groups. We're going to do the Waltz of the Bells. Well, he marched in like this, and put that circle now, and he had to do do this, your thing. I said now, and the Dogwood Arts Festival was in Knoxville, up there, a town. And I said, you do that, we go up there. Listen, he took those kids and marched around a perfect circle. And then the second, for second grade verse, perfect circle. We did our thing, and she said, you can go. And some of the people up there, the parents said, they have boys and girls, they have boys and girls. I'm not going to take my boys and girls and make a fool out of myself doing that. Like when I said, you, be good, you behave, you behave. I said, <laughs> and I never, I did, I spanked a girl one time. <laughs> I did, well, when I went to the mascot, I did not have a, well, when I went to mascot to teach, I always, East thing bother me when you you go through school is if you ever go to a teacher's room and she says now we don't do this and we don't do this and we don't do this and we don't do this. just gives you ideas. <coughs> well, so I I I told the boys and girls I said I have two rules to start with and if we have rules that need to be done for class we'll make them as a group. I said easy for me to make it that I will cure him put then you're better. And uh, so uh, this. Uh, kid came in there and what he say about me. Uh, I, I, I lose my train of thought all the time. And, uh, oh, and uh, I said uh, two rules. Well, the first rule was since you're mining camp, the language was kind of loose. And I said two things. No bad language. You can't say bad language. But I have to hear you say it. You can't say it. Well, she said a bad word. Bad language. And you can't, bad language to each, each other or about anybody else. And I said, I left the room, I said, now, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to correct you if you break that rule? If we, we, you break that rule I've made. Here, about 10 minutes back in, signed her name, three licks. <laughs> so you had to do it. I didn't have any paddle. So I didn't have paddle. I had a parent made me a paddle. I give me this old screw down desk. I had the ink well on. That board underneath that, he made me paddle out of that. Oh. And I still had it. Well, about... Six weeks later or something like that, I went by the girls' bathroom and somebody said, your mother's just a GDSOB. <laughs> I said, come with me. And I popped her three times. And the boy says, he whips girls. <laughs> My brownie points went up. But the strange thing was, many years later, when I was at Bricky, this beautiful lady came in and I said, what are you doing here? And that's her. She said, I'm bringing my daughters to a good school. That's when they could do that thing. Right. And, uh, and she said, he's one, me one time, I said, I really deserved it. But see, if you correct children that way, it's easy. It's just like when kids come to my office, we do it. I said, when you go out the door, it's over. You didn't carry a grudge. No, I said, it's over. And they, they left with a clean slate. Well, I, I had these three things, you know. I told a child, I said, you have three offers. Three, if you do something, you have three things. One is, if, that, if you've done something in the teacher room, you go down and take on the window walk in and you set your butt, I said to boys, set yourself down and behave. Well, secondly, tomorrow morning you will beat me at 8.30 and you know how high energy I am. And I said, you're going to spend from 8.30 to 12 with me. And if it's boys, I said, you, you better, I said, and you don't pee and eat on my time either. So, and I just bore him out. I just, 
They were worn and, out when they finished. And the third time I put my hand up, I said, I'll call you that at work. See, I'd been there so long, I knew parents who to call because they'd be former students. And uh, that didn't last too long. When I, if I put my hand up, start my hand up, I said, if, I will do it. <laughs> but, well, when kids come in doing something, like you come in there, I said, you sure are a pretty girl. You got a sweet smile, pretty eyes, and all these things. But I said, what's all this other stuff you're doing that I don't understand? And then you win them over. And I said, you know, I do love you. I tell you one time, a uh, teacher sent me a boy. He's kind of special needs. But he liked me. We were a really good friend, big old boy. Well, she sent him up there for doing something dumb in the room. And I took a talk to him and said, it's one of those busy days. Well, I went back there, and there he was again. And I said, what are you doing in here? And I don't ever raise my voice. I looked at him and I said, you know what I'd like to do, just haul off and slap you off that wall. And his eyes turned <laughs> and, my, and my secretary dropped her book. You and didn't do that, did you? No, no, You just no. wanted to. And okay. then I told him, I said, you know what? I said, I feel that way in my heart, and that really hurts me. Because I said, I'm not a physical person. And I, that's the way you made me feel. And I said, I do love you. And I said that, he grabbed me and hugged me and just cried. We both cried. That was it. Didn't have any more trouble out of him. I saw him ten years later. At a Target store in Fountain City, and I, I thought, I'll see if he speaks. And oh, he says, hey, man, where are you going? So he remembered you. <laughs> and, and I said, put my hand. He said, I don't want a handshake. I want a John R. hug. I haven't had one since I've been gone. And, that's t- and we both cried. Isn't that awful? But no, he remembered that. Oh, yeah. And you made a real impression on him. Well, John R., think back over your experiences. What were a couple that you would say were real success stories? Mm. I think one of the best success stories for me is having your parents involved in the right way. Because I had been there so long and I had taught so many children's parents there so many times. And so we go through this thing there and uh, so I would just call parents. But I never had a parent threaten me I never had anybody cuss me out, and I never have had a teacher, parent come up and go whip a teacher. They might have had mine, but that never happened. Well, you earned their respect. And then I'll have to tell you this one time. My daughter Melly went there, and she and two other girls were cheerleaders. They'd done something, so I jumped their case. I said, you won't cheer that happens anymore. Usually at school things, I just took care of them. And uh, so I got a phone call this mother. Well, the girl's mother. And she was so upset. La, la, la. Her daughter, la, la. And she could be time to say anything. So she told her husband, I'm going to just straighten John R. out tomorrow. He said, I bet you $10 you don't. Well, she walked in and she did all this stuff. I said, now you through. I said, Mary across the street's going to run her. She said, she was a the community yak of her, told everything. I said, she didn't tell you the truth. Why? She always tells me the truth. I said, no. I said, your daughter and my daughter and the Huff girl, three good friends, did what I didn't want to do. And I was going to tell them to go cheer. They got that in. Well, no, wait. And then she says, damn, I've lost $10. Went home. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, uh, I never was just back to the corner for anything. It's just, um, I'm always a happy person. And you want, to, you want to be a good listener. I talk a lot, but I am a good listener. And uh, just, the hardest thing was uh, when I retired, when I was 62, I went to, Joyce and I went to Nashville. This young lady put all this stuff up like this, you know. And she had talked a long time to me and told me how much I'd make. She said, can I ask some per- you a personal question? I said, well, sure. She said, you're the happiest man I've ever talked to. She said, so you, so you didn't say anything bad about anything. It says you love kids, you love your parents, you love what you do, and you're healthy. Why are you going to retire? So I didn't retire. I you didn't retire at that time? I stayed 65. Okay. And then you retired. Mm-hmm. Now, John, you've had a lot to do with the credit union. I've How been a member of the credit union since 55. I'm an oldest board member. So you're still on the board there? Yes, and we're... Uh, I wanted to decorate it. Uh, we have, you know, we bought a new office. Yes. South. 
So I have. Is it open yet? The sound. It's open in February. February. So I've gone to clean up and I paint all the bay windows. And you do that yourself? Yeah, I paint all the time. I paint church all the time. Preacher and preacher wants my clothes. Now on Sunday I always wear a tie and dress up. They say he's got something new on. Well, today. you look nice today, and oh. you don't have on a tie, so that's good. Well, I wear the jeans too a lot, but anyway. Uh, but I, I'm the same size I've been since for 30 years. Well, I, you work it off, I would suspect. I walk a mile. I walk a mile this morning. I walk a mile this afternoon. Okay, now you painted the building when you were at school, too, didn't you? You said you painted Oh, yeah. It. Well, one time, I'll tell you this. One time, uh, I had been to the beach, and I was brown, and I was, I think, bar barefoot, and I was painting the office. June did, Miss Glass called, ah. and painted the building like the office color. I said, well, I'll paint that. And so that's the time when you're interviewing teachers. So uh, I had on cut-off jeans, barefooted, brown, hair longer. I had more hair I have now. And I saw this cute thing come walking up the sidewalk, you know. I was, I'm not interviewing my head today. I'm not interviewing anybody today. And uh, so she came in and she says, uh, are you the custodian? I said, <laughs> sort of. <laughs> Joyce says, you're shot you for that. Anyway. And I said, I said, what do you need? She says, uh, I'm up for here an interview. And I went on my desk and flipped that stuff. And I thought it looked kind of funny. And I said, your name's so-and-so, and you're supposed to come tomorrow at 10 o'clock. Oh. Said, boy, you tell Mr. McLeod. I say, Mr. McLeod, she started crying. Oh, I've embarrassed you. <laughs> I heard her. <laughs> she was afraid she wouldn't, she wouldn't get the job. With well, me. Joel said, what did you do that for? That's awful. <laughs> but you had fun with it. You had fun with it. Now, John R., if you had to turn the clock back, would you do it over? Would you make changes? What about it? I'd make some changes, but I wouldn't do it over. Because the Lord blessed me my whole life. So you'd, you'd go through that again? I said, I'm, that's, I'm healthy, and I have friends, and my mind's good, and I do a lot of things. And I work, I'm a treasurer at church, and I have a senior group I work with, and I paint, 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 paint. Bruce likes me because I'm free. You know, I'm lay leader in a Methodist church, and uh, <clears throat> you, we do, I do the payments, and I get the people who do these things, and we do communion. And I said, time I do communion three times, I'm going to be drunk as a coot. <laughs> but in the Methodist church, you know, you christen children. Mm -hmm. Well, the first time I did that, you have this like, goblet of water there, and I said, hold that. Bruce, we have a wonderful minister. I punched him. I said, Bruce, do I drink this or what? He said, John R. <laughs> <laughs> he had to smile too then, didn't yeah. he? Yeah. So. But anyway. But I, I'm active in my church and uh, I do a lot of stuff. But I don't do I don't do anything I don't like to do, long to do. And then I got about five or six older people I call once a week. And the other my girl for my sweethearts, and I call one lady and Miss Needham and and her daughter rest, retired from Union County. But she and I said I called and she's in the hospital. And she said, Well, she's not been talking to anybody. I said, You think she's talking to me? She said, Mother, you don't talk to John Arnold boy like that. She said, what are you doing? I said, what's my number one girlfriend doing in that bed? She said, I, do, I better be number one. And she talked to me just like this. And she said she had the best day of your soul. Well, but you they're were, lonely. You, and you were encouraging to her. And probably one of the reasons, would you say this is true, that you've been so happy all these years, yeah. is you enjoyed what you were doing. Mm -hmm. and well, people ask me, see, now, Joyce has been gone six years. And I had a marvelous mate. Yes, you did. And she had some health problems and stuff, but she never, ever got up and come to in the house and said, I feel bad today, I'm going to stay in bed. Never. And she always combed her hair and put on a little back face stuff any time she came out. And you asked, of course, she'd had rheumatoid arthritis, and she had a brain cancer twice. Wasn't sick one time with chemo or nothing. But you asked her, hey, do it. And, of course, she wore this wig because she got off her hair. I said, I tell you, you got to sex this head in town. I used to kiss her on top of the head. But anyway, um, she wasn't sick at all, and she never did say this, that, not about herself. And Melanie looks like, my daughter, Melanie, of course, my daughter, Melanie, teaches French at Beard, and that's her 25th year. And she looks like Joyce, talks like Joyce, but Lord, she's John R. to the hill. <laughs> but she's happy and does good, and she has a good school. She and has, she has to be a good educator. Yeah, she loves what she does, yeah. and I try, to, I try to teach her or people, I say, you know how to worry about stuff. I said, honey, things in education that you can't change, don't worry about them. So she said, I eat with a group of teachers, and all I do is talk about school. 
She said, I don't eat with them. She said, I'm not that. I said, I don't want to do that. Well, and, and she wants to expand her. her well, yes. And, but she does a lot of stuff. She has some. And Melanie's got these things for ears, you know, here. And uh, she's not a flower girl, but anyway. And she looks like Jaws. I was saying, she dresses nice, and she, she's Pilates and all that stuff. And so she has pretty blue eyes, and she always wanted red hair. And so she dyed her hair red and short. Well, I'd like to cover her first. And so I said, okay, it's just hair. <clears throat> anyway, then this year, she went back to her nationally start brown. Kids didn't like it. Oh, we don't really? like it, Miss Kennedy. We don't like that. So they wanted her red hair and back. She got red hair okay. back. They were, they were accustomed to that. So see, change is good sometimes, John R., isn't it? Well, she's a kind of changeable girl like that, and she has a lot of qualities, both of us. She's been not blessed, but anyway. <laughs> but I had just, well, you know, she was at Powell, and, and the funny thing was, you know, they named a library in her own, and my name was Perky Stewart. And she said, Dad, what they'll do, they'll put my picture in the custodial room. <laughs> <laughs> well, that'll be a mem remembrance anyway. Because I always taught her, I always taught teachers, new teachers, I had a lot of student teachers. I said, the first thing, I got them in those cafeteria people. I said, you can take that, and you're custodians. Yes. And I told that Melanie, Melanie has a custodian, a black fellow for her custodian. She loves him, and he's so good to her, it's unreal. And those, those are important people in our schools, and they're good for our children, too, because they, they know they can go. If you go in and talk to children, they know they can go to custodians, they know they can go to cafeteria workers and talk to them just like they can the principal or their teacher, and that's wonderful as well. Well, like you know, you used to talk about, uh, I did, now I, at Bricky, I didn't have a whole lot of free lunchers, but, did. but I always told my cafeteria people, I said, no one goes hungry. Right. No one. Now, it's not like that now. It's, but you saw to their needs. Well, John, are you truly have made a significant contribution to Knox County Schools and to the kids, not just the students, but the teachers, and not just the teachers, but the community, and you continue to do so. Is there anything else you need to tell us before we stop this interview? No, no, no. But I'd just like to say that uh, I do it over again. And I go to break, they say, he's here, he's here, he's here. And they hug me around the legs. And that's better than money, is it not? Oh, yeah. That hug I said, I said, if I felt bad, I could go to Bricky School for an hour and feel wonderful. Because the boys and girls would make you feel that mm -hmm. way. And that's good. And it's just, uh, the sad thing is I have, in the last year I have, like Kathy Green had her, it's good. But I, I had a mascot young man that died, and he's 72 years old. Really? The funny thing you about You kept that, up with him. The funny thing was I was talking to him, and he was a poor hat full of beer, but he worked conservation type, you know, and he had pistols. And then that cast that had his pistols on his stomach, I said, he's going he's to shoot his way one way or one the way other. Or, one way or the other. Well, John, I thank you for taking your time. Uh, I don't know if I told you anything, but... You did. You, you've, uh, you've shared a lot with us. At, but uh, I really, I, will, I couldn't function now in school I, because uh, cause Miss Doyle was superintendent, and she made me, a, and Miss Patterson made me a wonderful principal. And I could talk to him any time, and I never was put on the carpet for anything, and because I knew what I could do and what I couldn't do. And sometimes you did things for uh, Miss Doyle said, any time, I remember the, when the first year we had to work up after a month. Uh -huh. See, I used to, in summertime, I used to run the forest camp at Greenville. Oh, okay. I did that. I used to do a lot of forest yes. stuff. And uh, so then I... Then, because Melanie's mom, that's where she learned to swim. And the second year I went to 4-H camp, all the workers in there were former students of mine. See, you, you knew, you trust. And it's a good summer job for kids. Yes. Some of them are co college kids. But anyway, we get in there and do all those things. And that was a rich before. I was always happy in that. And I was always did a lot in KCA and things like that. So that was good. Well, thank you for being here to share with us. And I'm sure as people in the future look back at this they'll be able to tell some of the past and what made it tick with john r mccloud thank you for being here you just have to have a lot of love and yes you do you have to love people you love people the and thing of it is and that didn't change did if you it? disagree it has nothing to do with my loving you but you say a kid tell them about you they'll you tell them, says i really love you but that's not what you do that word love does a lot and it has to be genuine. And John, our yours has been. Did it I tell is. you about my autistic child? No. 
Let me tell you that. See, I go back and they do tests. And so uh, TCAP studied a test for him, and he was now, autistic. Is this your volunteer work? Yeah. You're uh, doing, okay. He was autistic. Well, I, I help with TCAPs. And then, uh, <clears throat> so I never worked with an autistic. He was a fourth grader, and I met, met, I met him, and kind of shy. You know, they're shy but smart. Mm -hmm. So the second day, you know, his roof, I said, Herbert, I'm old. You walk and come up here and meet me. So I had walked before. He did walk and put his arm around everybody. Says, I can't believe he did that. I can't believe he did that. I said he'd be doing more before it's over. And so we did this. And so the last day I had him test, I got him a gift. And so we had, we used the music room. So we get through test time. We just play the piano or do something. We do play all those instruments and stuff. Anyway, uh, then um, I said, you know, I just love you. It's fun. And hugged him, and he hugged me and told me, he says, I just love you too. Well, the second day his mother called me, and she said, Mr. McLeod, said, he's different. He says, he had, he said, he didn't even hug his daddy. He said, he hugged his daddy the other night. I said, it's there. But see, like that. And well, it's that genuine giving of yourself to others, and they, they know that. The students know that as well. And so you've always done that. They know if they do something wrong, they know I would still love them. Yes. Yes, but you'll correct what they've done. Yes, yes. Well, listen, I want to thank you again I for thank being you, here. I thank you, and, and I love you, too. I love you, and thanks, Abusha, for what you've done. I use that word love a lot of times. Okay. I love you.